It's wonderful to be here, and uh, I had no idea how many people would actually turn up for a 9 o'clock session, so I think this is uh, far better than I was expecting, so I'm impressed. To start off today, I want you guys to do something for me. I want you to imagine the best meal you've ever enjoyed. And while you're doing that, I'm going to tell you a few of mine. I was sitting on a milk carton in Casablanca in Morocco, watching a woman cooking on a little open fire, cooking all these different dishes for us, pouring tea for us. There's about eight of us sitting around this makeshift table on the side of the street. Over the two hours I sat there, not a single word of English was spoken. We spent the entire time with hand gestures, with smiles, with laughs, but we communicated around the food. Definitely one of my most memorable meals. Another was sitting on a beach in Mauritius, cooking again over a fire, octopus that we'd gone and harvested that day, lobsters that we'd gone diving for, copious amounts of champagne to ring in the millennial new year. Started out as a really small group of us, friends, family, and soon grew to be the entire village of Tamarind Bay. Everybody came out and partied on the beach. Good thing we brought lots of champagne, and they brought their own drinks. And the party went all night long, but it started with food. Another amazing dinner that I remember was way up in the Canadian Arctic, on the side of a frozen river. It was minus 15 degrees outside. Way different than, obviously, the 40-plus degrees we're going to see here today. But we had 66 guests outside around these two huge bonfires, and we were cooking everything from the ground. Seal meat, caribou, arctic char, indigenous plants that we'd managed to harvest off the ground. And we're so far north, we had to fly in our own firewood just to have the fires. We actually had chartered a private 767, and we put all of these guests on the plane, as well as the best chefs from Canada, the best bartenders, and we'd flown these guests all the way across the Arctic over 10 days. And anywhere I could land a plane that was that size, we landed and we went and explored. We met with the Inuit, we met with the local elders, we met with the youth, and all of them came out to this dinner on the banks of this river. And it was magical. It was one of those experiences that you'll never recreate in your life. There was a book called The Last Supper that was written about where the top 50 chefs in the world would have their last meal. Out of those 50 dinners, only one was in a restaurant. Food is evocative of creating memories, of creating connection. It has en enormous power. I've only got 20 minutes up here, but I'd be curious what your most memorable meals were, what your last meal might be. But as chefs, our job is to create food. When I was walking around the show yesterday, I noticed there was lots of technology, there was lots of gorgeous food, chocolate carvings, gorgeously plated dishes, big business. There wasn't a lot of story. There wasn't a lot of feeling to it. And as chefs, that's our job. Our job is to start creating and creating that connection. Create experience. Create memories. And how we do that is people connecting with people. Chefs connecting with chefs. Servers connecting with guests. People, place, and stories. As the video said, my background is the chef. I've been cooking since I was 12 years old. I also went back and got an MBA in finance, and I've built eight different businesses, everything from retail stores to restaurants to a salt manufacturing company, Canada's largest culinary travel business that started as chef-guided market tours and gourmet kayaking trips, expanded to partnering with Audi Canada and doing food and wine driving trips. And I can tell you the only thing I've booked here in Abu Dhabi so far is the ability to go drive a fast car on the racetrack, because uh, nothing could be more fun than that. I've cooked at numerous Olympic Games. I've cooked in Michelin-starred restaurants. I've cooked in hotels. It all comes back to creating connection. 
I spend most of my time now traveling the world, working on culinary tourism strategies and lots of other things within the industry. I literally have cooked from pole to pole. I've worked at the world's northernmost lodge on Somerset Island in Canada, helping them uncover what the food of the north might look like. I've worked on the expedition ships going all the way down to Antarctica, helping them take food from Argentina, Chile, and crafting a story as far south as you can go, and a hundred countries in between. There's so much out there, so many stories, so much culture. Currently, I'm splitting the bulk of my time between Canada and New Zealand, and I'm working in everything from food waste with Trendy, working on food innovation and the value chain, working on destination marketing, working on ocean sustainability with the Ministry of Primary Industries from New Zealand. In Canada, where I wrote the National Food Tourism Strategy, we're also working on two innovation hubs, one focused on fermentation, one of the oldest techniques in the world that's coming back. I'm also recreating the entire culinary experience at YVR, Vancouver International Airport, a five-year program to craft what will be one of the world's best culinary experiences in an airport. I've been spending a lot of time in Africa, recently just in South Africa for Afro Africa Travel Week, looking at South Africa that's actually producing nine provincial food strategies that'll help set a framework for that entire country. Been having conversations with Chef Binta up in Ghana about a Fulani village and creating that historical story and employing local people. Chatting with the Chefs Association in Liberia, who I know uh, are actually in the room here at some, somewhere, yeah. Um, a country that's so proud of, it, of its culinary heritage, but doesn't actually have a cooking school to train its youth. How is that possible in today's world? In the US, I do product development, create restaurants, and that's where my salt company is also based. So as you can see, I've got my hands in so many different pots, but all of it relates back to story. So the focus of today is bridging cultures and building communities through food. Today, more than ever, we need to create an experience, not just food. The dining scene around the world is becoming more and more monochromatic. You go to LA, you go to New York, you go to Abu Dhabi or Dubai, go to Tokyo. Everywhere you can pretty much find almost any cuisine on the planet now, all in one city. That's not a unique story. That's just part of being in the game nowadays. Menus are being crafted to be focused on everybody and all of the different ingredients and all of the different menu items Everything. I mean, you see restaurants now that have sushi, pad thai, steaks, Indian curry, everything on the same menu because they think that's what guests want. But when you think about what the most visited country in the planet is for food, which is Japan, 67% of all visitors to Japan list food as their primary reason for visiting. That's a country where they still focus on a dish per restaurant or one type of cuisine per restaurant where somebody might spend 10 years honing their craft for one part of one dish. But culinary needs to service people, needs to provide amazing service, needs to create an atmosphere, and obviously there needs to be the food. And you put all of those together, it creates experience. And that experience creates connection. So how do we connect as chefs? We do it through our food, through our ingredients. There was a book that was written a few years ago in 2021 called Eating to Extinction. How many of you guys have heard of that book? One person, two people. Amazing book, talking about the history of ingredients in, in the world. Did you know there's 40,000 edible plants on this planet? 7,000 of which are cultivated, but only 170 of those are commercially significant, and of those, only three make up, the 50, make up over 50% of the caloric intake every day of the entire planet. 
maize, corn, sorry, maize, wheat, and rice. 40,000 plants down to three. Connection comes via community. As chefs, we know without ingredients and quality ingredients, we're nothing. So we need to celebrate our farmers, our fishers, our foragers. They need to be part of the story, of our community, of our restaurants. Food sovereignty is super important. We're in danger of losing so much over the next two generations. We need to talk to our elders, both from an indigenous standpoint, but also just across the board. They have so much to share, so much knowledge to give, so many stories that they can share. But we're going to lose it if we don't document it, getting written down. The other person we need to engage, the other people we need to engage with are the youth. And I'm excited to see the youth here. I think they're actually all out on a field trip at the fish market this morning. Um, but they're the future of this industry. But it can't be just at cooking school. No matter where I seem to go in the world, the number one complaint of the industry is there's not enough staff. People aren't coming into the industry. We need to create a better industry for them. We need to engage them as young as five years old. Get them cooking, get them excited, make them understand where their food comes from. And then craft an industry that they actually want to be part of. Looking at better, better pay, better working hours, all of those pieces that will create a better community. When I look at indigenous community building and strategies, I'm reminded of a recent trip to South Africa. I went to this restaurant that was just recently voted best African restaurant in South Africa. And it's called Emma Zuluwini. And it was started by a young woman actually in an incubation space in South Africa, 20 seats, but everything in this restaurant is a memory from her childhood. The menu is written so that it reflects how she used to walk to school and the smell of the bread coming down the street. Every dish has a story. Every dish has a purpose. And when she brings the dish out to your table, she tells you that story. You feel it. You feel that connection. That connection with her translate into the connection with food. Another restaurant that I went to in South Africa that was about two and a half hours outside of Cape Town was called Wolfgat. How many of you guys have heard of Wolfgat? A few more. Number 50 on the world's top 50 list. And the most unpretentious restaurant I think I've ever been to that is elevated to that level. It was a hut on the side of a beach, watching the fishermen come in every day, bringing their catch in, watching the local kids swimming in the water, Simple tables outside on a patio overlooking this vista. And the chef, Chef Kolbus, brought every dish to every table. And he trained all of the local youth to be his staff. All of his staff were from the village. And he brought them into his kitchen, into his community, into his space to not only train them, but then to allow him to create that connection with his guests, to create that connection with his producers to be a focal point in that village. That's, in my mind, the future and what we need to be striving for, that connection. When I think about bridging cultures and indigenous cultures specifically, I think about the Yukon up in the north of Canada. Imagine this area, it's twice the size of Germany vast. In that area, there's 25,000 people. So more animals than there are people. Yet it still has a food culture. It still has a food festival that's actually voted one of the 10 best in Canada. 51% of the population is indigenous. It's their stories. It's their land. And they're being brought together with the rest of the community to tell that story. Recently, it actually even had one of its restaurants voted one of the 10 best new restaurants in Canada per capita. That's incredible. Working in New Zealand, I work with the Maori and the Iwi tribes down there, helping them elevate their food back into modern gastronomy. They're super excited to be able to tell their stories. And yet, 
in the last few years, there's only been one Maori restaurant in all of New Zealand. One South Pacific restaurant. And yet it's the largest population of South Pacific in the world. Those cuisines are getting lost. Food security is a big issue in New Zealand. And they're working with fishermen, recreational fishermen, to save all the heads and frames. And they're distributing them to South Auckland and other unfortunate people who are having issues with food security. There's ways to create this community through food, and it continues to build. One of my most profound moments was going to Fiji, and I worked for a little private island there. That was where the wealthy of the wealthy went to holiday. And every morning, I'd watch all these boats come in filled with lobster and fish, all these treasures from the sea. And they'd load them into a cart, and the cart would get rolled right past the guest kitchen straight to the back, straight into the staff kitchen. And there's this hut, again, a fire that's been built, and they're cooking all of these amazing foods. And I'd walk back there, and the smells and the laughter, they were so proud of their cuisine back there. And then I'd walk back to the, staff ki to the guest kitchen. Hamburger, pizzas, pastas, a teppanyaki grill. Australian beef that they were paying $80 a kilo for to fly in, and yet lobster was going past at 20 bucks a kilo? I'm like, why are you not sharing your food with the guests? And they said, well, they wouldn't want our food. This is peasant food. I'm like, people fly halfway around the world to try and connect with you. They can have pizza, pasta, and burgers anywhere in the world. And we started bringing out those food foods. We started getting them to come and engage with the guests. The food ratings went through the roof. People kept, the re return visitation to the island continued to grow because people actually started to connect with the people. Indigenous stories and culture are tied back to stories, tied back to cultural relevance, connected to nature and connected to abundance. I like the word abundance a whole lot more than I like the word sustainability. Because abundance reflects quantity. It reflects respect for the land. It respects the ingredient itself. Sustainability, in many minds, it just means financial, st financial sustainability. I asked one of the biggest fishing companies in New Zealand, what, is, what does sustainability look like for you? And he said, well, the fact that we'll still be here in 80 years. Had no desire to talk about what might or might not be in the ocean. So what can you do to create connection? Obviously, you guys are all here. This is a big part of this, is understanding and collaborating around the world with people, building that community, creating and sharing stories. But remember what the history is where you come from. Engage your suppliers and your staff. Engage the local, in, the local indigenous peoples. They want to be part of the conversation. They want to tell their stories. They want to share their lands and the location because it's part of it. As chef, we need to move from traditional to experiential, which we've done. It used to be you'd go to New York and you'd get a t-shirt that said, I was here. Then it became, I want to experience something. The new word is transformational. We want to transform the story. We want to change people. We want to make them learned. We want them to feel better and more educated and more connected when they leave. I was fortunate to travel through India for a month with my three daughters, who at the time were 12, 10, and 8. We were fortunate we ate in grand palaces with gold cutlery, silk walls, chefs who came out fully robed. But we also spent time eating in people's homes, sitting on a dirt floor with a single fire burning at the end of a stick because it was the only piece of wood they had to cook for two weeks. Bats flying overhead. We cooked in the middle of farmer's fields and ate amazing food. We went to a jaggery farm in the, and they got to go and experience sugarcane straight from the fields. When they think back on that trip, 
It's not the palaces that they remember. It's the connection with the people and the place and those fields and those homes. Food needs to be real. It needs to be unpretentious. We need to continue to focus on innovation, development, incubation. We need to help businesses grow, flourish, prosper, and become new. We need to focus on traditional villages, like what's happening in Ghana and other countries around the world. We need to look for new experiences, and we need to design restaurants in new ways that offer more connection, that offer more story, that allow chefs to be more engaged. Again, going back to transformational, we need to go into learning, we need to focus on change. It needs to be simple, authentic. Again, people connect with people. People don't connect with an ingredient. People don't connect with a white tablecloth. People don't connect with china and amazing glassware. They connect with people. We're not recreating the world here. Food has bridged cultures and built communities for thousands of years. Food is always the vehicle. And as chefs, we're focused on the ingredients and techniques. But I want you to take away from today that we need to focus on the people. We need to focus on the place. We need to focus on the stories. We need to focus on that connection with history and with people. Thank you so much for having me.